Hello, Idaho, and welcome to the National Cybersecurity Center's Cybersecurity for State Leaders Program. I'm Forrest Senti, Vice President of Programs and Operations. And I'm Maddie Gullickson, Program Director of our Secure the Vote initiative. We are so excited to be here with you today. And for background, the National Cybersecurity Center, or NCC, is a Colorado-based nonprofit dedicated to cyber innovation and raising awareness of pressing cybersecurity issues. Our programs cover cyber education, election security work, and a co-development of the first ever Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Our mission is simply to do what we can to secure the world. And that's why we're excited about this program today. And with that, did you know that 95% of all data breaches come from the government, technology, and retail sector? Governments are a huge target for these type of things, not only for their data, but also for the fact they deliver critical services. And as leaders in state government, you are the front lines in helping to secure democracy. You are the front lines of democracy. By championing investments in cybersecurity for your state, as well as modeling strong cybersecurity practices for your colleagues and constituents, you are leading the way to a stronger cyber future for us all. And that's why we've designed today's training, with you as legislators and legislative staff in mind. We know you're busy, and so if you need to drop off at any point during today's live session, we've created an on-demand, self-paced option for you to take to complete today's modules. This can be accessed at any time via cyberforstateleaders.org. Once you've finished today's training or finished the training on your own time and take a short post-training survey, you will receive a certificate demonstrating your completion as well as your dedication to advancing cybersecurity in your state. We've developed a dashboard on our website that will track the number of certificates per state, so make sure to get your certificate and share it through your LinkedIn or social media channels to do your state proud. We've created an additional opportunity to elevate your state's commitment to enhancing cybersecurity and that's a cyber certificate. You can nominate a state leader to um, sign that cyber certificate via cyber for state leaders at cyber-center.org. And with that, let's get ready to dive into our modules. We've broken up our topics into three main categories, including an overview of why cybersecurity matters for your state, a breakdown of some of the major attacks you could be a victim of, and finally an outline of some key steps you can take immediately to start better securing yourself. Please keep in mind that in spite of the challenges of pulling a training together like this in the midst of the pandemic, the benefit is that we've been able to bring together a series of experts from all over the country. While we personally had to use a studio in the making of some of these videos, other experts were kind enough to bring us into their homes and offices. Some of the people you hear from today are people like West Virginia United States Senator Joe Manchin, former DHS Cybersecurity Deputy Undersecretary Mark Weatherford, senior experts and researchers from places like Google, Microsoft, and IBM, and even a special message from Shark Tank Shark and cybersecurity guru, Robert Herjavec. And because we have such limited time, we have an additional section for things like resources on learning more about election security or the Small Business Administration, some of the things that they do for all of us. In addition, for tips from experts on how to prepare for and respond to things like a cyber attack. So keep an eye out for additional materials throughout the year as we move on. Exactly. And before we get started, we want to say a huge thank you to the speakers who have shared their time and thoughts with us and to Google for supporting this initiative and helping to make it possible. One of our first speakers is your very own Governor Little, who, will, who was kind enough to share a special message to kick us off today. Hi, I'm Governor Brad Little. Cybersecurity is one of the most important issues facing our nation and our state. In an increasingly digitized world, where most people rely on technology to get through the day, Americans are more vulnerable to cyber attacks than ever before. States, too, are increasingly vulnerable to direct attacks and the impacts of those attacks. State leaders can help protect against potential attacks by becoming an active part of defense for states. I'm proud to support cybersecurity for state leaders to help train state leaders the front lines of our democracy on cybersecurity best practices to defend against potential attacks. Improving individual cyber awareness will foster a culture of security, making all of us more secure. Thank you for your help in this important endeavor. Thank you so much, sir. To complement his message, we, have, we are grateful to have our CEO, retired Lieutenant General Harry Radigan. General Radigan served for over 35 years in the Air Force, working across multiple sectors of information technology, communications, space, network, and cyber operations. 
Hello, state leaders. I'm Harry Radke, CEO of the National Cybersecurity Center, and I thank you for joining this training session. Cybersecurity could not be a more critical issue at this time, and I am grateful that so many of you are willing to take this time to learn how to defend yourselves against cyber attacks. I have worked in the areas of network operations and cybersecurity my entire career, from protecting the global information networks of the Department of Defense to developing cybersecurity risk management programs throughout various sectors of government, industry, and academia. I've had real life frontline experiences in protecting, defending, and restoring information networks from physical attacks like establishing the restoration priorities for over 5 million circuits in New York City following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, to fighting cyber crime, espionage, and service denial attacks across both public and private enterprises. As I look across the landscape of what we now know as cyberspace, I see more opportunities for connectivity, collaboration, and innovation than ever before. But at the same time, I also see the rise of foreign threat actors, criminal organizations, and nefarious individuals who can do nearly irreparable damage with a few swift keystrokes. Never before have we dealt with such instantaneous threats, leveled against every sector of society, working daily against our individual identities and assets, critical service distribution systems, information trustworthiness, and the integrity of our most important critical infrastructures. The most recent Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, targeted at the tail of the Solar Winds incident, reveals just how important cybersecurity has become at the federal, state, and local levels of government. And of course, the recent scare at the Florida Water Treatment Facility only makes the connection between cyberspace and our physical space that much more real. Issues like these that states and localities are facing today underline why your participation in this cybersecurity training is so important. State governments provide many services and functions that are critical to maintaining the integrity of our democracy, and you are a critical part of the defense of those activities. So not only do I hope that this raises your level of engagement on cybersecurity topics, but I hope you take advantage of individual cyber best practices shared here today, because by doing so, you are strengthening your state's operations and defenses. Thank you and enjoy the training. Perfect, thank you so much, General, that was wonderful. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. If you experienced any technical difficulties throughout this thing today, please email cyberforstateleaders at cyber-center.org. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to answer them here, but if we can't, we'll be happy to follow up with you after today's training. So with that being said, we're gonna start by jumping into a real world example of why cybersecurity matters at the state level. To do that, we have Herman Stockinger, Director of the Office of Policy and Government Relations at CDOT and Transportation Commission Secretary. He's gonna walk us through an attack on the Colorado Department of Transportation in 2018. He'll share how the attack happened, what it impacted, and what legislators just like yourself can do to help support state agencies in defending against these kinds of incidents. Herman? Hello, my name is Herman Stockinger. I'm the Deputy Director for the Colorado Department of Transportation, or CDOT. And I'm here to talk with you about how our agency handled a cyber attack. On February 17, 2018, an attack began to occur on CDOT's computer network. This infiltration made its way through CDOT's network, affecting servers, users' computers, and data by ransomware. Every entity of CDOT's business operation was affected in some way, and it initially put the majority of communications and operations in the dark. 
questions like, can we pay our employees? Can we pay our contractors? Did the attack include infiltration of our highway electronic sign network? Even the question of how do we keep 3,000 employees busy if they can't use the computer for an undetermined amount of time were questions we realized we really weren't prepared to answer. CDOT has experience with large scale disasters. In 2013, Colorado had unprecedented floods that washed away highways. We created an emergency response team to handle that disaster. One wouldn't think a computer software disaster is on the same scale as a natural disaster, but it really was. Similar to the response to our 2013 floods, we developed an emergency response team at CDOT. And on March 3rd, the state established a statewide unified command including cybersecurity experts from the Colorado National Guard and led by the state's emergency management agency. Unified Command not only focused on CDOT cyber network, but the larger potential vulner vulnerability to the statewide network. Our headquarters auditorium became a 24-7 command center where dozens of experts worked around the clock to find and eliminate threats. And then when monetary ransom deadlines were not met, a second intrusion occurred. Weak points were identified and the impacts continued to reveal themselves throughout the incident. On March 23rd, the program brought full resolution to the cyber attack. In the final outcome, CDOT never paid the ransom and we built a stronger future for CDOT security. Between responding to the disaster and accelerating pre-planned upgrades, the disaster cost over $3 million. Being prepared for this type of threat involves instilling a mindset for all employees that the threat is real and involves preventative maintenance for systems and users, keeping up with the latest available technology to prevent attacks from happening, and the ability to communicate through multiple systems and diversifying resource dependency. Thank you for your time. And let's all keep doing what we can to keep ourselves and our communities safe. Herman, we truly appreciate you walking us through that experience. Obviously, keeping technology updated is a critical component, as is enhancing the regular monitoring of networks. This discussion raised another unsettling question that more communities are having to face, whether or not to pay ransoms in the face of these types of attacks. And it's not just large state governments or large state business or large businesses, excuse me, that are dealing with this challenge. Cyber attacks on local governments have increased nearly 50% since 2017. Often the attacks look and feel similar to the CDOT example, where data and files are ransomed in exchange for a large payoff, usually in the form of cryptocurrency. Governments must make the choice to either find or reconstruct a backup of the information being ransomed or pay. Attacks like these on local governments or even hospitals or school districts can be crippling because communities may not be properly resourced with the tools, staff, and best practices needed to prepare against criminals. If they don't have the needed structures and resources, chances are they don't have backups or monitoring in place to avoid paying the often hefty ransom. And every dollar spent to a cyber criminal is a dollar not spent in that community on critical needs and services. And this leads us to another important discussion point. As we work from broad cybersecurity issues at the state level to your personal security, we want to emphasize the varying levels of complexity involved in securing enterprises. Personal security can feel very complex, which is why we're excited to share the resources that we will today. But the time, resources, and strategy required to protect entire state and local enterprises is incredibly challenging. Basically, while the steps we will walk through later on will make you personally much safer, the steps to make state enterprises secure are far more costly and intensive. And your role as a state legislator is critical in supporting those efforts. Absolutely. And the one thing I want to stress is while there are best practices, cybersecurity resources and tools are not one size fits all. Part of the challenge in cybersecurity is navigating the policy area around this fact. In order to move forward as communities, states, and the country as a whole, we have to continue to learn what our communities need and how to maximize things like local, state, and federal resources to meet those needs. Here today is Heather Nauer. She's the former spokesperson for the United States Department of State. and She's here to share a little more about the threat landscape that the various levels of governments and society are facing as well as a key exercise that various organizations can develop to help highlight the gaps, as well as clarify strategies in responding to incidents. Heather? Hi, 
I'm Heather Noward, former State Department spokesperson and acting undersecretary for public affairs and public diplomacy, here today to talk to you about the importance of cybersecurity. This is one of the most important issues facing America today and was one of the top issues that we worked on while I was at the State Department. Every day across America, adversarial foreign governments and criminal groups look for ways and new ways to infiltrate our networks. Cyber hacking and ransomware have become weapons of choice for these groups. Why? Because it's cheap, it's easy, and can be so lucrative. Some companies even pay off the ransomware attackers just to get their data back. Not only is this wrong, but it encourages more attacks and puts us all at risk. And that is why state and local governments and the private sector are under attack like never before. Not just large organizations are at risk, but smaller groups too. Elected officials and CEOs must take steps to strengthen their network's defenses. This training curriculum is a good first step to prepare you to be vigilant. Then it's essential that you establish a robust cybersecurity policy and hold frequent drills. I encourage clients that I work with to go beyond just strengthening their networks. Hold tabletop exercises, essentially mock drills, and determine a communications plan for employees, the public, customers, investigators, and the media. Hopefully you will never have to execute on this plan, but the stakes are simply too high to not be prepared. Thank you, Heather. I know here in Colorado, the Secretary of State's office hosted a tabletop exercise on cyber attacks and elections, and it helped drive a lot of great strategic connections and discussions. And as we think about some of these types of exercises, we can't not talk about one of the key individuals who works to help states maneuver the cyber landscape, the Chief Information Security Officers, or CISOs. While primarily responsible for helping to protect the state enterprise, CISOs can be key in connecting local communities with resources, as well as help drive policy direction. To help us walk through more of what CISOs do and how they can be a resource in the policy arena, we have Debbie Blythe, Colorado CISO. Debbie's been Colorado CISO since 2014 and brings over 14 plus years of information security experience to the position. I'm Debbie Blythe. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Colorado. So what is a CISO? The Chief Information Security Officer is responsible for setting statewide security policies, for working with state agencies to evaluate risk for their programs, for monitoring for security threats and leading incident response, for ensuring state systems comply with state and federal laws and regulations, and ensuring that vendors are providing systems and services that comply with state policies for monitoring and reporting on risk across the state. CISOs are protecting against things like ransomware, which lock up systems until you either pay the ransom or restore from backup. Also against denial of service attacks, which can take important systems offline and also against data theft. Now to do that, we need to have a good security program in place that is continuously evolving to make sure that we are protecting against current threats. We also need visibility across all state agencies and people monitoring our networks and systems to ensure that as an attack is occurring, our teams can detect and stop the attack to minimize damage. It's super important that legislators have some understanding of cybersecurity concepts so that they can protect themselves as well as empower state CISOs to defend state systems. So what can you do to help? Your state CISO would love the opportunity to talk to you about their cybersecurity programs. They can provide a status update on what they've accomplished and where they still need help. And they need your help in funding and prioritizing their programs to ensure the systems in your state remain continuously available with data well protected. Also, listen for bills that may have a cybersecurity impact and feel free to pull your state CISO into the conversation. They can be used as a resource to help advise on things that may cause increased security risk in your state. I'm Debbie Blythe. Together we can make America a safer place for all of us and protect what matters most.
Thank you so much, Debbie. Your work and the work of all CISOs is critical. We hope you all get to know your CISO after this training. So, faced with the complex state, local, business, and personal challenges, what can you do? Well, one of the first things is to become aware of how cybersecurity impacts the lives of your constituents in your own life on a daily basis. But alongside that awareness, it's important to start to learn that there are practical steps you can take as a policymaker and an individual to begin proactively working toward a cybersecure future. And that's what you're doing right now by taking this training. We won't cover every major threat or all the tools in the toolkit, but we are going to cover some fundamentals that will help you create a foundation for more cyber learning. And by establishing a strong foundation, you can continue to add not only to your own personal learning and security, but to the greater security of your state. To drive that point home, we have a special message from West Virginia Senator Manchin, Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, on how the work you do to learn more about cybersecurity on a state and personal level makes us all safer. Senator Manchin. Hello, I'm Senator Joe Manchin, and I appreciate this opportunity to touch on the importance of cybersecurity. As we know, cybersecurity awareness is vital across many different sectors, both personal and official. I'm proud to serve as chair of the Senate Armed Services Cybersecurity Subcommittee, which oversees policies and programs related to cyber forces, operations, and capabilities. As technology continues to develop and play an integral part in our daily lives, we must ensure that we are equipped to handle every cybersecurity threat that comes our way. Here in the Senate, my entire staff participates in cybersecurity training, which details how to identify red flags in a suspicious email, the significance of two-factor authentication, and provides overall guidance of how to protect yourself online. Additionally, social media is a significant part of our outreach efforts. It allows greater communication between me, my staff, and our fellow West Virginians. And that is why we continually work to ensure it remains a safe, secure platform for us all. This past year in particular increased the need for online education and services. And with that comes an even greater need for awareness of how to defend yourself against online vulnerabilities. So thank you to the National Cybersecurity Center and Google for showcasing best practices and promoting awareness for online security. God bless. Senator Manchin, thank you so much for your hard work and leadership on this issue. And as you pointed out, you as legislators and you as staff can all be a key part of your state cybersecurity. So thanks again for taking the time to invest in it. With that, the next module we're going to tackle is a lot about what the standard cyber attacks are and why they can succeed. Then we'll jump into how you can defend yourself against these types of attacks. Exactly. So here we are at module two. The first attack we're going to cover is phishing. This is a huge one. Phishing attempts are everywhere and attackers have gotten incredibly advanced studying our behaviors and fine tuning their approaches to exploit our vulnerabilities. In order to better prepare ourselves against this type of attack, we really need to understand what it actually is and ultimately why it works. Forrest, take it away. Imagine checking your email and receiving an alarming message about one of your online accounts. The email says that your account has been compromised and it provides a link to enter your private information. The email sounds and looks legitimate, but it wasn't real. Instead, it was sent by cyber criminals looking to fish you. Phishing and spear phishing are some of the most prevalent cyber scams because they work. Phishing is when scammers send out mass emails hoping to trick people into divulging personal and financial information by pretending to be a legitimate source like a bank, a trusted retailer, or a delivery service. Phishing scammers often ask the user to reset passwords in an attempt to steal information. And unlike random phishing scams, Spear phishing, just like it sounds, is highly targeted and points directly at you. Spear phishing scammers might even use social media or other public information to find out personal details. Then, they use this information to craft fake emails that sound believable and real. This type of scam is one of the most popular methods used against people of influence, just like you. If you fall for a campaign like this, you may end up downloading malicious software or malware that can infect your device. Alternatively, criminals sometimes install a type of malware called ransomware, which is designed to block access to a device until a sum of money, often in cryptocurrency, 
is paid. Once criminals have control over your device, they can change your passwords, steal your money, and even your identity. The good news is that there are ways to help prevent phishing emails from impacting you. Knowing what they look like is the first step. No legitimate bank, government agency, or business will send you an email requesting that you re-enter your private information. Misspellings, poor grammar, and typos are also clues to watch for. If you receive a phishing email, the best thing to do is stop. Don't click anything in the email or share it. And contact IT support. Stay vigilant, take a breath, and think before you click. Thanks for that, Forrest. One of the things that criminals and bad actors, actors are trying to get through your through phishing or spear phishing attacks are your passwords. If a criminal doesn't get your password through a phishing attempt, they may try other ways. We have Thomas Russell, our cyber education manager, to share more about that. Did you know the average person has 27 online accounts? And each of those accounts requires picking a username and a password. I'm sure you all have heard of the advice to pick complicated passwords, but many of us still choose the ones that are easy to remember. On top of that, a lot of us use the same passwords for all of our online accounts, which only increases the chances of being compromised. Part of the reason we may not get too creative when it comes to passwords is because we might assume it takes a lot of work to hack millions and millions of passwords, and so ours is likely safe. But it's not as hard as you might think. There are a few ways hackers work to get your password. Brute force is the simplest, but can also take the longest time. Hackers simply try every combination of words and symbols they can. To make brute force attacks easier, hackers might use a tactic called a dictionary attack. A dictionary attack uses software to try to guess the passwords by randomly cycling through different combination of words, symbols, and numbers. Some dictionary attack software can work through millions of combinations per second. Be careful answering public survey questions on social media about where you went to high school, what year you graduated, and what city you're from. Criminals can use these hints to try and break your password. Another popular method hackers use to get our passwords is through phishing attacks or sending fake emails trying to impersonate legit businesses in an attempt to get your credentials. Start with using a password manager. These require you to remember only one complicated password to access your personal password vault. For all your other accounts, the password manager generates complicated random passwords. If you don't use a password manager, try using phrases instead of single words. And whatever you do, don't write your password on a sticky note and leave it on your monitor or on your desk where someone else can see it. Remember, your password is the first line of defense to protect your online information and a starting point for all good cybersecurity. Thomas, thanks again for such an incredibly helpful walkthrough. Passwords are such a critical part of your security, and this is one of the most significant vulnerabilities that we have too, because we create so many passwords and accounts. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is a slightly less known attack that can compromise your security, SIM swapping. This attack is really more likely to target people just like yourselves, so check it out. A SIM card is a small plastic chip in your phone that tells your device which cellular network to connect to and which phone number to use. Most of us don't think twice about our SIM cards, except maybe when we get a new phone, but we should. SIM swapping is a cybercrime that occurs when someone contacts your wireless carrier and manages to convince the call center employee that they are you. Cyber criminals do this by using information from previous hacks, data breaches, or something you publicly shared on social networks. Then they trick the call center employee into switching the SIM card link to your phone number and replace it with a SIM card in their possession. In some cases, SIM numbers are changed directly by telecom company employees bribed by criminals. Once your phone number is assigned to a new card, 
All of your incoming calls and text messages are routed to whatever device the new SIM card is assigned to. This makes it easy for a bad actor to access your online accounts because they can use two-factor authentication against you because they are now the ones that account security information is sent to. The devastating results could be anything from selling your social media accounts to stealing your identity. So how do you protect yourself? First of all, contact your network provider and select a PIN that anyone calling to make changes will need to know. Secondly, use better two-factor authentication, such as the Google Authenticator app, rather than short message service, aka text. The Authenticator app links to your phone rather than your phone number, meaning that a hacker would need to get a hold of the actual device in your hand. The next time you pick up your phone, just remember there is more than one way to hack your accounts and it could come directly from your number. Stay vigilant, a little extra caution could make all the difference. So similar to SIM swapping, another vulnerability we might not think too much about is what can happen if your device itself is stolen. As legislators, you actually might be an even greater target to this type of attack. And here to talk to us through more is security expert Maurice Turner. Hi, my name is Maurice Turner. I'm an election security expert. I'm here to talk to you today about the threats that you might face at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. The challenge with physical security is that sometimes those cybersecurity protection measures you have in place can be bypassed if an intruder has physical access to your device or systems. I'll start off with a couple of tips that might be helpful to you. First, Consider using a second factor of authentication, like a security key. It works together with your strong password in case that strong password is stolen or somehow compromised through a data breach. Secondly, consider having an automatic lock on your devices. This can be as short as five minutes. So that way, if an employee steps away from a device, the system automatically locks without the employee having to do anything. Lastly, Many mobile devices have built-in remote wiping or remote tracking features. These can be activated if a device is lost or stolen and turn that device into a digital paperweight. To help put this into practice, here are a couple of scenarios that can get you planning in the right direction. The first scenario, what would happen if you needed to evacuate your building and be out of your office within 60 seconds? What devices can you quickly lock down and what devices would remain open and unlocked for an intruder to potentially have access to? A second scenario to consider is, what would happen if an employee called you to say that their device had been stolen from their home office overnight? How would you be able to restrict access to the data that's on that device or to help prevent that employee from being impersonated online? These are just a couple of things to consider at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. And as always, practice makes perfect. It's just like buckling up when you get into a car. At first you had to learn it and someone had to show you, but now it's just second nature. So hopefully security will be second nature to you as well. Thank you for your time and especially thank you for your efforts in keeping yourself and our community safe. Thank you so much, Maurice. To close us out of this section, we're going to switch gears to an even less tangible threat, but one that now takes place in our world daily, that of misinformation and disinformation. For this discussion, we have the NCC's Chief Strategy Officer and resident cybersecurity expert, Mark Weatherford, to share some insights. Hello, my name is Mark Weatherford, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. I previously served as the first Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration and was the first Chief Information Security Officer in the state of California in the Schwarzenegger administration. I also served as Colorado's first Chief Information Security Officer under both Governor Bill Owens and Governor Bill Ritter. The challenges of misinformation and disinformation are everywhere today. And while the recent Russian misinformation campaigns to distract American voters and the ongoing fake news about COVID-19 are front and center, 
they're only the most visible. History is rife with fake news. Everything from Sasquatch to the Flat Earth Society and aliens from Mars to the Pigman. Someone is always out there looking for new ways to exploit those people willing to listen. You may remember the Twitter incident in 2013 when hackers compromised the Associated Press Twitter account and tweeted that there had been explosions at the White House. This was a legitimate source, so most people, for a very short time, assumed the information was factual. The stock market even took a quick but dramatic dip following that tweet. I recently read a story about a sign taped to an elevator in an apartment building informing people that using the elevator would soon cost $35 a month. The tenants were outraged and launched a social media attack on the building manager, only to find out that it was a prank. Unfortunately, the damage was done and cleaning up the mess took far longer than starting it. A quote attributed to Mark Twain goes, a lie can travel around the globe while the truth is still putting on its shoes. With the vast reach of social media today, that quote should be amended to say, a lie can travel to the moon and back while the truth is still sleeping. Misinformation is simply false information, while disinformation is the intentional spreading of that misinformation. While the strict definitions are slightly different, disinformation is a challenge today because social media has created vast opportunities for sharing information that simply didn't exist just 10 or 20 years ago. Combating disinformation is a challenge, make no bones about it. But there are a few things we can all do, and they involve critically thinking about and evaluating information before sharing it. It's an unfortunate sign of the times that we should all be a little paranoid about what we read online today. Here are eight things to critically evaluate before reacting to social media clickbait. One, can you readily identify the source of the information and is the source credible? Sometimes it's difficult to determine, but if it sounds sketchy, it probably is. Two, are there multiple sources providing the same information or is it just one lone enlightened source? That's a red flag. Three, does it evoke a strong emotional response? Memes have become notorious for generating quick emotional responses because it's so simple to just repost or retweet a meme without even thinking about it. Four, does it sound absurd on its surface? Again, sketchy probably is. Five, check the dates. Stories and pictures often resurface years after originally posted, usually with just a new twist on the message. Six, is it time sensitive or is it gonna cost you something? These are always red flags. Seven, does it appear to be just satire or is someone just trolling for fun? Eight, does it leave you with questions like something seems missing here or these facts don't add up to a complete story? If so, maybe dig a little deeper before becoming another victim in the threat of disinformation. Disinformation and fake news are tearing at the fabric of our national and even global society, pitting family members against family members, friends against friends, and political parties against political parties. All of us need to be consciously aware of how we're consuming information, and more importantly, how we're sharing and spreading information to ensure we aren't contributing to the problem. With some simple critical thinking, we can all be part of the solution. Okay, that was a ton of information, and now I can imagine that we're feeling a little bit nervous about how we can protect our, ourselves against all of this. But the great thing is, is that if you incorporate the next module's habits into your daily life, you will significantly reduce your risk of any of these attacks being successful against you. And again, that's crucial, because the safer you are, the safer your colleagues and constituents are. And with that, we'll dive into our final module on how to protect yourself against all these types of things. Exactly. So we've covered why cybersecurity matters, what types of attacks you may see, and now we're going to tackle the most important part, how you can protect yourself and not get duped. There's a lot of material in this section as well, so if you have a tough time taking notes, know there are one-pagers available to highlight the main tips on our site. So, and in thinking about these top tips, we've broken them down into really easy ways to practice excellent cyber hygiene into a really easy-to-remember acronym that Robert Herzvig, Shark Tank star and founder and CEO of the Herzvig Group, has been kind enough to break down for us. Hi, this is Robert Herjavec. You might know me from Shark Tank, 
What you might not know is I'm a cybersecurity expert. You know why I'm an expert? Because I've been doing it for 30 years. I started out in my 20s with mainframe security, did a lot of VPN and firewalls and all that kind of stuff. And today I run the Herjavec Group and we're one of the world's leading managed security and complex security companies. We do everything from design and consulting and managing large environments, including many government organizations. And we all know, especially governments, how much we are all under attack. The level of attacks is increasing at a rate never seen before. And it's just gonna continue with this post COVID world and everyone working from home in the digital economy, it's only gonna get harder. And you know what? You gotta stay smart online and don't get duped. And what does that mean? Deploy multi-factor authentication. Update your software regularly. Passwords, make them stronger. Your first dog is not enough or your kids' names, make them stronger. Encrypt your messages, files, and backups. Don't click on things you shouldn't. Thank you, sir. We couldn't have said it better. Now let's get into the details. To start with deploying multi-factor authentication, we're pleased to have Lucian Tio, Google's online global safety lead, to help clarify what multi-factor authentication is and how we can and should be using it. Hi, I'm Lucian Tio, online safety lead at Google. Most of us are used to logging into our various devices and online accounts using a single factor of authentication, like a password. At this point, you would have learned how to create strong passwords, and you'd also know that you should be using unique passwords for every account you have. But given the growing sophistication of cyber threats, especially those aimed at sensitive information held by state legislators and government employees, you might want to consider using more than one type of authentication or what's called multi-factor authentication. Enabling multi-factor authentication is like adding a pin activated security system on top of your normal lock you already have on your front door. Multi-factor authentication incorporates different pieces of information like something you know, something you have, and even something you are. Something you know is the most common type of authentication. Passwords, passphrases, PIN numbers, secret questions, and smartphone swipe patterns all fall into this category. These types of authentication are great, but adding at least one other form of protection is critical for good cybersecurity. Something you have is another type of authentication that requires a piece of physical hardware. This could be a USB key, a smart card, or a random code generated on a dongle. Codes sent to your phone via SMS would also fall into this category, though SMS authentication can fail if you should become a victim of SIM swapping. A better alternative for something you have would be an authenticator app such as Google Authenticator, which requires you to have your physical phone in your possession. You could also use personal biometrics such as fingerprint scans, facial recognition, iris scan, or even a voice print as a form of authentication. These types of authentication are more difficult to compromise. Most online accounts offer steps for at least two-factor authentication and keep an eye out for the common question of, would you like to use multi-factor authentication or would you like to enable two-factor authentication when you sign in or create an account? Your IT department can also help guide you to these options. Though any of your accounts that contain personal information should be protected, it is important to be extra vigilant with your email, social media, and financial accounts, as they are some of the most commonly targeted by cyber criminals and can be especially damaging for civic leaders and state legislators. Besides the obvious theft of information and finances, bad actors can use your accounts to pose as you and deploy harmful and inaccurate news and information. For additional information about setting up multi-factor authentication, 
contact the specific software or account you're trying to protect. But ultimately, setting up multi-factor authentication is relatively simple and significantly more effective than a simple username and password. And trust me, the extra steps you take to deploy multi-factor authentication on your account, especially in addition to the rest of the view practices, will make you safer. Thanks again for a great explanation, Lucian. Thank you, we appreciate it. The next up, we're gonna talk through software updates, why they matter and how to do them. Software updates are particularly useful in protecting against things like malware attacks. And here to share with us more on what to do with them is Ethan Chumley, Senior Cybersecurity Strategist for Microsoft's Defending Democracy Program. Ethan, take it away. I'm Ethan Chumley with Microsoft's Cybersecurity and Democracy team, and I'm here today to talk to you again about hygiene. And no, I don't mean the flossing or the scrubbing kind that are part of your daily routine. I'm referring to cyber hygiene, a critical part of keeping your computer system secure. If you're not sure what hygiene looks like, just think of those little pop-up windows that ask you to install the latest operating system version, the latest app update, or that next patch. And I know, just like you, waiting to install those updates during an already busy day can seem tedious, but this is a key practice to maintaining good security. Getting in the habit of downloading and installing the latest software updates is an easy way to keep yourself, your networks, and your computer safe from a security incident. Why? Because when bugs or vulnerabilities are found in software, they're typically fixed quickly by the software vendors, but it is then dependent on you to install those latest updates when prompted. Just like flossing, updating your systems is a routine preventative action that can keep intruders out and keep your data safe. Not to mention, it's a lot cheaper to be preventative than to clean up after the fact. We encourage regular updates across all of your devices, from the apps on your phone to the software on your laptops, even the smart fridge and Wi-Fi connected thermostats you may have in your home. Of course, your IT departments need to update shared servers and websites and backend systems too. Patching and restarting those shared servers might cause some downtime and feel inconvenient, but well-communicated maintenance windows during off-peak hours are essential to good security across all IT-owned systems. Your security needs are ongoing and they're constantly evolving. There are bad guys out there hoping that you don't apply the latest patches and updates because you'll just be making their jobs easier. Many of the hacks we hear about these days were avoidable, as they relied on victims' computers running old and out-of-date software, often a result of ignoring patches and delaying major software updates for weeks, months, or even years. If you're watching this video, that means you're a leader in your community. This means you are in a position to contribute to a culture of security. And as a leader, you're in the position to help your organization align to security best practices. This might mean allocating funds or asking your IT teams about how they're managing updates responsibly. And finally, it means you're in the position to encourage the community, businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations around you to practice good cyber hygiene, to make sure they are updating their systems and that everyone is encouraging one another to be vigilant about creating a secure environment. I thank you for your time, for your commitment, and thanks for clicking OK on that next update prompt. Thanks, Ethan. And with that, let's dive into passwords again for a little bit. This is one of the most challenging things to keep track of and potentially the source of one of our biggest vulnerabilities. With that, please join us in welcoming Stephanie Carruthers, the Chief People Hacker from IBM's X-Force Red Team. Stephanie is a career white hat hacker and is here to give us the tips the experts use to make and protect their passwords. Hi, my name is Stephanie Carruthers, or you can call me Snow. I'm the chief people hacker at IBM's X-Force Red. I'm so excited to be talking about passwords with you today. Now, to set the stage a little bit, my team and I, were a bunch of hackers. We're paid by organizations to find flaws in our cybersecurity before criminals do. Now, with that being said, 
I wanted to say that I'm coming at this from an attacker point of view. As I'm talking about passwords, I'm also going to be talking about how to make yourself more secure. So you might hear things like your password should be strong and secure, or your password should be long and complex. But what does that actually mean? First, let's take a step back to really understand how criminals can crack or brute force passwords. So let's say you're signing up for a new website and you enter in your new password. Well, what the website does is it takes that password, it scrambles it all around and it saves it in a database. That scrambling process is called hashing. So if a criminal breaks in and steals all the hashes from that database, they can't just read your password. But what they do is they use really powerful computers and word lists. Now, each word on the word list is hashed as well. It has that same scramble. So what they do is they take your hash of your password that they got from the database and they run it against their word list. And once they find a match, they know exactly what your password is. Now, here comes in the, your password should be long and complex. So if you take a password that's only eight characters long and let's just say lowercase letters, that could take seconds to crack. Now, if you take a password that's 10 characters long, let's say eight lowercase letters and two special characters, that could take hours to crack. Hopefully you see where I'm getting at here. Take a password that's 12 characters long and a mix of random uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, just this mix of things that could take years to crack, which is perfect. A criminal's probably not gonna wait years for your password. They're gonna move along with someone else. Now, what do I recommend? I say to be safe, 16 characters, and make sure it's that complex, that randomness. You wanna make sure you cannot read any words or see patterns. The key here is the randomness. Now we're on to our next issue of password reuse. So let's say there's a website you log into often. Let's go with your bank. And there's another website you frequent just as much, maybe a social media platform. When you created accounts on these, they probably had some type of strong password requirement. So you use the same one on both websites. Now maybe that social media platform had not a great security posture. An attacker was able to hack in, steal the hashes, crack your password, and they now have your username and password. Well, attackers are clever. They know that you probably use the same password through different logins. So they might try them at other places like your bank. Now that is an issue, but to combat this, we can use password managers. Now password managers is a place, think of it like a database that stores all of your usernames and passwords to every login that you have. Now there's many options for password managers. Most of them even have free tiers for the everyday consumer. So what you do is when you sign up for an account, it can be a little tricky, especially as you're adding in all of your accounts, but I promise you it's worth it in the long run. And even as you're signing up for new accounts, they do things like they generate those long, random, complex passwords for you. So you don't have to think of them yourself. They also autofill for you so you don't have to go in and, and dig through things and try to find your password. There's um, lots of conveniences. They have mobile apps, they have browser plugins. They're definitely there for your convenience. So you might be thinking to yourself, great, I've solved a couple of issues. I know how to make a long complex password to my password manager and my password manager stores all of my unique login credentials. Now, what happens if an attacker actually gets the password to my password manager or still another website that has a long complex password, then what? Well, this is where multi-factor authentication comes into play. Sometimes it's referred to as two-factor authentication. Essentially how it works is if you log into a website and you supply your username and password, you still have to supply a second factor. Now that might be a code in a text message or something you have to approve on an app on your phone. There's different ways that this could work, but essentially if the attacker doesn't have that second code, they can't log into your accounts. Now it's really important that you deploy this everywhere you can across every account. Typically it's under security settings in your account. Now, this isn't a silver bullet. Attackers are getting crafty. Sometimes if they try to log into your account and you do have 2FA, what they might do is launch a social engineering campaign against you. They might call you claiming to be the bank and they need to verify you. So you need to confirm a code that you just received 
or they might text you and say, hey, I used to have this phone number. I accidentally sent my code to you. Can you give it to me? Under no circumstances should you ever give out this code. No organization is going to call you for your multi-factor code or for your password for that matter. All right, a couple of takeaways. Your password should be at least 16 characters and random. The randomness is key here. You should also have a different password for every account you log into. You can use a password manager to help you do this and even help you generate those long and complex passwords. And also enable two-factor authentication on every account possible. Thank you so much for your time and keep doing what you're doing to keep ourselves and our community safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Stephanie. While 16 characters may seem a little daunting, think about it this way. If you use a password manager, and there are several now, examples include LastPass, Keeper, or Dashlane, then you really only have to come up with one super complicated password, and that will help keep you way more secure online. So the next thing you have coming up is about encrypting emails and files, and backing these important files up. These three are thrown together because they're complementary. They both help protect against things like malware attacks and help protect you in case someone does get into your stuff. Our presenter on this topic is NCC board member Leslie Kershaw from Siren Solutions. And we're excited for her to share her 20 plus years in cybersecurity to talk through encryption and backing up files. Leslie? Hello, my name is Leslie Kershaw and I've spent 20 years in the field of cybersecurity First, as an NSA offensive cyber operator, using attack methodologies to gain access to systems on behalf of our government. Later, I used those insights to help commercial entities harden their defenses. What I've learned over the years is that security measures cannot be overly cumbersome, otherwise users will not implement them. While the best security is to avoid technology altogether, that's just not realistic. The other thing that I've learned over the years is that no matter how good your security, a determined attacker given enough time, resources, and incentive will gain access to the systems and information that they want. For you, this means that you should do your best to implement tools that make it difficult for an unskilled or moderately skilled attacker. When faced with advanced aggression, the best solution is to formulate a good recovery plan. Today, we'll talk about encrypting email to prevent sensitive data from being viewed by unintended recipients. We'll also talk about how to back up data so that you can recover if you are the victim of, a, of an attack. Before the internet, we relied on the postal service to deliver messages for us. When we were on vacation, we would send those glossy postcards filled with details about the fun times that we were having. We didn't care if anybody saw them. When faced with difficult news to share, we would write a letter and fold it into an envelope. We may even buy envelopes that had additional security to protect the sensitive information of their writing. When we think of our email messages, we should think of them in the same way. Unencrypted email is that postcard that anyone can read with limited tools and knowledge. When we communicate sensitive information, we need to use encryption to wrap our message in that protective envelope. There are three mechanisms that you can use to encrypt messages. I'll go from the simplest methodology to the most difficult. The first is through enterprise encryption. This will be set by your organization's IT staff. The encryption will leverage S-MIME, which allows for the encryption of any type of data that you would like to send. They will issue you a signing certificate that can be tied to your email. Once you install this, you'll simply check the encrypt email button or the lock button to encrypt your email message. As long as your intended recipient's organization also supports an encryption management server, you can send and receive without issue. Leveraging this will take care of 80% of your sensitive communication. If you want to send an email to someone who does not have encryption management at or their organization, or you just want to add an extra layer of protection, you can encrypt the document itself. To do this, if you're on a Windows system, you can select to WinZip the document and then add the password. 
If you're on a Mac system, you can just set a password under, under a file. Make sure that you send the password over the phone verbally or through a text. Do not send it in the email because if an attacker has access to the recipient's email, they can unencrypt your message. The last method is to use PGP on your email account and exchange keys with the intended recipient. The install and use of this goes beyond the time that we have left in this video, but there are great resources on the internet that can help you. The only drawback of this method is that it only encrypts plain text emails. Encrypting emails will help you thwart lower level attackers that attempt to pry into your personal data. Advanced attackers will use sophisticated methods to access your information and may even try to cause damage. Trying to recover from an attack is an emotional and time-consuming endeavor. It's best to prepare for it potentially happening by treating it like insurance. You build up the method to recover knowing that you might someday need it. Imagine that you knocked over a cup of coffee onto your computer right now and it won't restart. How would you recover all of that data? The simplest method is to back up your data in an automated way. Once the automation is set, you will never have to think about it again until it's time to recover. I like to use an external drive that I connect via USB to my USB docking port. That way, anytime that I connect my laptop to my external screen, which is also on my docking port, I'm setting up the automated backup without even thinking about it. If you're using a Windows system, just go to your system, then settings, then updates and security. You'll select that external drive that you just connected via USB. You'll set the interval and the backups will begin. If you're using a Mac, you have two methods available to you. The first is to connect to iCloud. You'll select the drives and the documents that you want to be automatically updated and they'll take care of that for you. The good thing about that methodology is that you can also access those files on different devices. You can also set up your Mac for external drive automated backup in a similar way. You'll just go to system preferences, select the time machine and follow the prompts. I hope that you never have to recover your files or that you're a victim of an attack. But if you are, I hope that this helped you prepare. Have a great day. Such a great discussion and so critical. We truly appreciate all of your tips, Leslie. And I think one of the things that's helped me a lot, at least, is setting calendar alerts to back up my devices regularly. Exactly. I mean, we set calendar reminders for everything else, so when are our backups? Well, we do have the final topic coming up next, and that's how to avoid clicking on things you shouldn't and what to do if you accidentally did, because to be honest, we've probably all been there. To share about how to protect against this, we're pleased to welcome Google's Sunny Consalvo, researcher and security and privacy user experience team lead. Sunny, thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm Sunny Consalvo, a researcher at Google who focuses on security, privacy, and abuse topics. By now, you've learned a lot about how to avoid email phishing campaigns. So in this module, we're going to dive a bit more deeply into how to be aware of what not to click on when it comes to web pages and what to do if you accidentally do. Let's be honest, we've all done something we shouldn't have. We've all clicked that link, you know, the one that takes you to a shady website or starts to download something onto your computer. So what are some ways to avoid doing that? First, let's talk about how you might figure out that you're on a shady web page. One sign might be that if you try to leave the page, you get bombarded with a pop-up asking you some version of, are you sure you wanna leave this page? Or maybe install our antivirus program. That should be a red flag right there. Another sign might be that you get a pop-up to sign up for more information, especially if it's hard to click out of that before you even reach the actual content. If the site is only mildly shady, be careful to not share any personal information or sign up for anything on your way out and just X out of that tab. But if it won't let you out, try closing out of your browser entirely. If that doesn't work and you're on a Windows computer, go to your start button and look for your task manager. From your task manager, look for your internet browser in the list, select it, then end that task. 
If you're on an Apple computer, go to the Apple menu, select Force Quit, then look for your internet browser in the list and force it to quit. At this point, it would be a good idea to open your antivirus software and run a scan. If you're unsure how to do this, check in with your legislative IT staff or your personal organization's IT staff to walk you through those steps. Though you may end up on less savory sites through simple internet searches, another way can be from links you receive in an email or text message. Before opening a link from a text, make sure you know who sent it to you, that it's someone you trust, and then it really is them who's sending it. If you don't know who it is or are suspicious that it might not really be who you think it is, don't open it. You can always contact the sender another way, for example, by giving them a call, just to make sure it's not a phishing attack. And when it comes to email, there are several tools you can use to proactively scan for malicious links or attachments. If you want to check where the link leads to, hover over it and make sure you recognize the source and that the source in the hover matches what's in the email. It's a good idea to check the source in your internet searches too, to make sure the domain you're about to click on is the right one. Most email platforms now have some type of alert or warning to draw your attention to potentially suspicious content. With Google's Advanced Protection Program, for example, even more stringent checks are performed before you try to download something. Advanced protection flags and may even block file downloads that may be harmful. These steps to protect yourself aren't done in a vacuum. Remember to keep all of your software, apps, and devices updated and ask IT for support in installing trusted antivirus software, firewalls, and email filtering. And of course, always back up your files. Criminals can't make you pay for information you already have. If you think your computer or device may be acting in a strange or suspicious way, or if you're simply unsure whether something is wrong, reach out to IT for help. Stay alert, practice good cyber hygiene, watch the other videos in this series for more information about what to look out for, and whatever you do, if you're not sure about it, don't click it. Thanks so much for your time. Your diligence keeps us all safe. So incredibly helpful, Sunny. And another key thing to remember as you're looking at various sites where there's a padlock at the top left of the URL, bell, URL bar. If there is one, chances are it is more secure. So again, thank you, and thank all of you for your time. Please remember to take this short survey to get your certificate to show your commitment to cybersecurity. We will be tracking all of these certificates by state, so be sure to make your state proud. And again, if you have a state leader in mind that you think should sign the cyber charter, please email us at cyber for state leaders at cyber-center.org. You will automatically be added to our newsletter that will share things like ongoing security tips and access to things like a roundtable discussion on things relevant to cybersecurity. So please feel free to share that newsletter with your colleagues and constituents to learn more. We genuinely hope that you learned something today and can incorporate some of these new things that we talked about today into your cyber routine. We look forward to staying connected and appreciate all you do to serve the great state of Idaho. Thank you.